Welcome to the weekend. I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute. You're watching Independent Thinking, so you're feeling okay? Is it a good time to get sick? Is it a bad time to get sick? Well, fortunately, the state legislature is out of session. That always makes me feel a little bit better. To talk about what we did in health care this session, Spencer Swam, uh, state representative, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jim. John. And, and Jim Reesberg, state representative, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Now, when we start talking about health care, there always seems to be a couple different levels because there's what we do on the federal level, then there's what we do on the state level. And amazingly, a lot gets done on, on the state level. You guys did a lot of work this year on health care. Let's, let's bring it over here. What was the most significant thing that the state legislature accomplished or failed to accomplish on, on health care? Uh, what was the biggest success in your mind? What was the biggest failure? The, the biggest success in my mind was that uh, passing a bill which will add about 100 to 200,000 new people to health insurance roles over the next couple of years and will stop the cost shifting that hospitals are now forced to do when they give a lot of free care and so they have to charge everyone else, those who pay cash and those who have insurance. The, the biggest disappointment is that we didn't do more with mental health in this state uh, because I think that's a real issue that we have to be able to put more dollars into and more services into. What about on your side? Well, I think we did some good things. I, I think the real question with health care is how do we control or rein in the underlying cost of health care? Uh, it's the underlying cost of health care that is driving up health insurance rates for everyone, small businesses and employers and large businesses alike. Um, I think we did the positive thing I th think we did this year was um, a bill that allowed health insurance plans to offer incentives for employers to uh, give their employees wellness programs so that if they get their employees enrolled in a wellness program they can get a reduction in their well, What's rate. a wellness program? Give me a definition. Th you know, for an trying example. to get your weight under control, trying to quit smoking. You're, trying looking, to you're looking at me when you say weight under control? <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily, John, <laughs> although hey, we could all probably use the stand to lose a few pounds. Um, but, you know, those kind of things, get your medications right, get diabetes and things like that under control. And, so, in uh, other words, you had a bill that gave employers some sort of encouragement to offer what we could call preventative uh, medical work. Well, and really wellness, well, trying right. to keep people out of the doctor's office. Let, let's, let's start off from a really large point of view and let, let's bring it back down. I know that with the Obama administration coming in here with uh, Democratic House, Democratic Senate, there's a lot of eyes towards D.C. to come across w of some sort of very large scale change in health care, perhaps single payer, perhaps some sort of nationalized system. We don't know yet. Was there a sense this year at, on, at the state capitol that, well, let's just hold off uh, and let's see what Obama does, and by the next session we'll, we'll, we'll have a better idea what we need to do here locally. I didn't sense that at all, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One was the 208 Commission, which gave their report uh, to the legislature last year, and the uh, building blocks uh, for better health care that the governor started uh, last year. So we started making incremental changes, not waiting for the federal government. Hopefully when the federal government gets its act together, it will be something that will set up some programs that states can can utilize to do the things they're already doing and begin to work together so we don't have 50 separate plans. But I don't think anyone expects the, the federal government to simply come up with something that everybody says, oh, yeah, that's the answer. I remember when, when Ritter was elected, there was some talk about health care. There was talk about us perhaps following a, the Massachusetts model, which requires people to have health care no matter uh, what and gives them no choice to go out and buy insurance. And if they can't afford it, we'll afford it for them. Uh, on, on your side of the aisle, did you find that that people are just waiting, biding their time to see what D.C. does, or? No, there what? were a couple of bills that actually did that this year. Both of them died. Actually, one was a single-payer bill that would have set up a single-payer plan in Colorado. Colorado. It made it through committee, but died in the House. Um, there was another bill that died early that would have mandated insurance coverage. When you, when you come to the federal state issue, I uh, am very nervous by turning everything over to the federal government because I believe the states can act as innovation laboratories and 
Um, you've got 50, or 50 different places where good ideas could come from, but if we turn it all over to the feds, we stifle that innovation. And I think this is an area we definitely need innovation. Let's, let's go over what I think was a signature bill for you, which was your Health Care Affordability Act. Uh, I was not a fan. Let me give you a heads up on that. I, explain to us in layman's language what exactly this bill does. It's a great title, but, but all things have great mm -hmm. titles. Uh, best way, Spencer, do you have a dollar? Could you give me a Don't dollar? Don't give it to him. Don't give it to him. I do, I yeah. think. Oh, this is props time. No, I, ju I just think that's a, that's a good way to do it. Spencer just gave me a dollar, and I have a dollar. Spencer, here's your dollar back. Thank you, Jim. And here's a dollar to go with it. That's what the bill did. The, the question that came up on the floor is, well, what did it cost? What did that cost you? Didn't cost me anything. It didn't, made something. Yeah, it didn't cost anything. It made something. And what the hospitals are going to make with that now is with this dollar, they can start to provide coverages for all those people they're now providing coverages for for free. And as a result of that, more people can have insurance when they come to the hospital. And when a hospital doesn't have to give away a lot of free coverage, they then don't have to overcharge the others. Okay. When they don't now, have to I'm overcharge the others, costs go down. Now, when I see free money, little red lights go up. I, I'm not a big fan of free money because I don't think it, it, it exists. So let me try my take at it. What this bill did, as best as I can understand, is it says that hospitals need to pay about another 5% uh, of hospital stays in, in a fee, what most states call the tax, what you call the fee, in which case the feds then have an extra 5% money that they need to match in Medicaid spending. So the uh, hospitals spend more or, or pay this fee, but it's supposed to come back very quickly from the feds. So first of all, let me challenge one thought. Is money from the feds free money? I mean, you just gave a hard-earned dollar to, to Spencer, and, and I would never do such a thing because I've, I've known Spencer a long time. And, but, but that dollar came from you. Now, the dollar from the feds is not a free dollar, is it? No. You called it a free dollar. No, I just said he got it. it you said it didn't cost him anything. It didn't cost him anything. It, and it, it may have cost him a little tiny bit in, in some taxes somewhere along the line, but everyone in the country is putting into those taxes not just Spencer. So in other words, this is a way to, to get more money from the feds. Exactly. Which we pay taxes to as well, so it's not, not free money. But let, let me ask you a couple questions. There, there are two big issues that I had with this bill. One, that this 5% fee and uh, the other 40 states that pull this scam, uh, no offense, they call it a tax. Why did you call it a fee? We're the only state that calls this a fee. Even the federal government calls mm -hmm. this a tax on hospital stays. Well, they can call it anything they want. What we know is the hospital stepped forward and said, we want to do this. We see a way that we can bring more money into the state of Colorado. We realize that we're going to get our money back and then some. But whatever you call it, what the people in Colorado said is, we want you to use best practices. Find something that's working somewhere and see if it can work in Colorado. It's working well in 23 states. Now I it's think, going to be working in 24. I think 24. there's a different answer to it. You called it a fee because if you called it what all the other states call it, we'd have to put it to a vote of the people. Is that right? I don't believe so, no. Bring it over here. Well, I think that's one argument. I, I, I think that's certainly a valid argument. And I had three problems with this bill. Um, first, it was intended to prevent cost shifting. In other words, the hospitals put the money up and then they get these federal dollars. I'm afraid hospitals are still going to shift this cost. Some of the larger hospitals in the state are going to be looking at a, a tax or a fee of $20 million a year. Many of these are profit-making entities. Uh, and I understand they're going to get some of this money back from the feds, but I still think there's going to be a tendency among those hospitals to try to shift those costs and recover the fee that they're paying. Second concern I had was well, this. When we're talking about the cost, just for clarification, we're talking about costs of people who come into that hospital who don't have insurance coverage, who, who might have to use Medicaid in order 